Thanks, Gil, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So home stretch. we're in the last session of the day. Thank you all for staying. Uh, my topic is on uh, managing uh, extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease. And I really think this is such an important topic to sort of revisit and update ourselves because of the um, landscape of IBD therapy is really expanding. And with, um, as we've talked about all day, as um, our drug therapies become more um, selective, you know, that when we have a patient who has severe extraintestinal manifestations, sometimes even more severe than their bowel inflammation, I think we really have to be smarter about which therapies we're using as first line, the orders of which we may be uh, recommending our therapies, and when to use adjuncts, including non-biologics. So as we know, IBD is a systemic disease which can affect nearly any, or, any organ in our body. And I just wanted to first uh, distinguish from the, uh, the extraintestinal manifestations or the uh, immunologically based uh, phenomenon such as uveitis and certain types of in, in, uh, arthritis from the extraintestinal oops, complications, sorry, which I won't be actually spending much time on. So things like osteoporosis, anemia, or psoriaform uh, rashes. I'm really gonna be focused on the extraintestinal manifestations uh, today. So upwards of 50% of our patients will experience extraintestinal manifestations. About a quarter of our patients will manifest before their IBD is diagnosed, while the rest of the three-fourths of patients will uh, experience extraintestinal manifestations after their IBD is diagnosed. I keep doing that going forward. Um, certain extraintestinal manifestations parallel IBD bowel activity. So classically, we think of erythema nodosum. But many of uh, the extraintestinal manifestations actually correlate poorly with underlying bowel inflammation. So this obviously has important treatment uh, uh, implications. So I'm going to first focus on the musculoskeletal manifestations, uh, specifically the arthri arthritides, because these are the most common manifestations in our patients, affecting upwards of 46% of our patients. And when we think about approaching IBD-associated arthritis, the most important distinction is to differentiate whether patients primarily have a peripheral arthritis affecting the peripheral joints, such as knees, ankles, or wrists, or whether or not patients primarily have an axial arthritis manifesting as hip, uh, pain and stiffness in the back, hip, or buttocks. And the reason why this distinction is so important is twofold. First, most peripheral arthritis tends to be non-erosive, whereas, uh, whereas many um, forms of axial arthritis are erosive, destructive, and can be uh, quite debilitating for our patients over the long term, so may actually warrant more aggressive top-down strategies. In addition, uh, one major difference is that with peripheral arthritis, it predominantly par parallels disease, uh, bowel disease activity, whereas axial arthritis is often has a course that is independent of IBD. So this obviously uh, leads to quite a different, uh, differing treatment strategies uh, for these two types of arthritis. So for peripheral arthritis, the key is if there's active IBD, then we treat the IBD and most peripheral joint pain will get better. And if IBD is in remission, there are a whole host of, of non-biologic so-called DMARDs or disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, such as NSAIDs, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, and steroids, which can be quite effective at controlling arthritis. For axial arthritis, uh, because it often has a course that's independent of the underlying bowel inflammation, it often requires its own treatment algorithm. And unfortunately, the tools that we have to, to control axial arthritis are much more limited. So actually, first line is NSAIDs. And actually, I'm going to be sharing some updated data that NSAIDs are probably safer than we have historically thought for use in our IBD patients. But if NSAIDs are not uh, effective or patients do not tolerate them, then the only real other therapy that's been effective, uh, shown to be effective for axial arth arthritis is anti-TNFs. The other non-biologic DMARDs, such as methotrexate or sulfasalazine, are actually not effective for axial arthritis. So if we delve a little deeper into the treatment of peripheral arthritis, there used to be this old classification system, type 1 and type 2 peripheral arthritis, and I've actually learned fairly recently from my rheumatology colleagues that this is actually no longer used. And what our rheumatology friends want to know from us and what we actually need to feed back to them is whether or not our patient's IBD is in uh, remission or if, there's, or if it's active. And so this really, oops, sorry, one more time. <laughs> 
So this really highlights the need for a multidisciplinary approach in treating these patients. So if a patient presents with uncontrolled peripheral arthritis, and we haven't restaged that patient recently in terms of their bowel inflammation, then it might be time to check a fecal calprotectin, repeat a colonoscopy or an enterography, because this will really change how we approach the peripheral arthritis. So if the IBD is active, well then we do, the ball is in our court, so to speak, and so we do what we know how to do best, which is optimize IBD therapy. We've spent all day talking about it. But if the IBD is in remission, then we can sort of volley the ball back into the court of the rheumatologists, and they have a whole host of, uh, of therapies that they can use. And I've actually listed here the order in which most rheumatology guidelines recommend for use in IBD-associated and other peripheral spondylarthropathies. And you can see first line um, NSAIDs appear here again. Um, most rheumatologists will want sort of our blessing that our patients can be uh, treated with NSAIDs. And like I said, we will go over the data in a few slides. But if NSAIDs are not helpful or, again, not tolerated, then uh, sulfasalazine, methotrexate, and steroids can be helpful. And uh, local intraarticular steroids are, more, are, are preferred over oral systemic steroids. However, if patients do not tolerate or, or do not uh, respond to any of these DMARDs, then we're thinking about adding or switching uh, to a biologic. And anti-TNFs here have the most um, data, as we'll talk about. So in contrast, axoarthritis, um, this actually is a, a sort of a disorder that falls along a, along a spectrum. You can have patients that have full-blown ankylosing spondylitis, and then there's this entity called non-radiographic sacroiliitis, which me basically means that the plain film is normal, but actually we know that a subset of these patients will have, an, uh, will have inflammation on an MRI with contrast. Where, where patients fall on the spectrum, um, the treatment is actually similar. So first line is actually two-pronged. Patients should be referred to a physical therapist for a structured exercise program. But then, um, this comes up over and over again with arthritis, NSAIDs here are actually uh, really quite emphasized. And that's because not only are NSAIDs helpful in terms of analgesia, but in the ankylosing spondylitis uh, literature, um, NSAIDs have been shown to actually halt the progression of ankylosing spondylitis changes radiographically. So really are disease modifying in this uh, particular entity. Now, again, if patients do not tolerate NSAIDs, and most of the rheumatology uh, guidelines re recommend co-treating with a PPI, um, then we are thinking about uh, escalating these patients to an anti-TNF, which, again, have the most data to support um, treatment in axoarthritis. Now, important to note is that second-line biologics, so if patients do not respond to an anti-TNFs, um, uh, second line for ankylosing spondylitis is an IL-17 blocker called secukinumab, and it's important to know um, that this class of medication should not be used in our IBD patients uh, because there have been cases in the rheumatology clinical trials of new IBD being sort of unmasked or, or um, being exa exacerbated, and in the IBD literature, this uh, this, this drug was actually studied in, for Crohn's disease, and there were enough cases of exacerbations that the studies were actually stopped early. So as I promised, I was going to talk about NSAIDs in IBD. Um, I think most of us reflexively cringe at the use of NSAIDs in our patients because they're well known, of course, to cause gastrointestinal ulcers. But really the data supporting uh, the use of NSAIDs as really causing um, IBD exacerbation is at most conflicted. So this, uh, the studies to date have been mainly retrospective case control studies. However, there was one large prospective study from Canada using the Manitoba Registry which showed two things. Number one, our patients are using NSAIDs whether or not we recommend them or not. In this cohort, 49% of the patients were using NSAIDs routinely. But secondly, reassuringly, uh, the NSAID users had no increase of flares over the five plus years that these patients were followed compared to the non-users. And in line with uh, this study, a recent meta-analysis was actually published by senior author Khalili et al., published in APT last year. And as you can see from the figure on your right, is that there was no clear association between NSAIDs and exacerbation of either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So what about COX-2 inhibitors? So as we remember from medical school, there are two um, COX enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2. And traditional uh, NSAIDs block both 
enzymes. And COX-1 inhibitors actually have important intrinsic gastric cytoprotective effects, and that's why traditional NSAIDs can cause ulcerations. Whereas COX-2 inhibitors have been shown to, to result in equivalent analgesia, but actually um, cause about 67% la less GI ulcerations and perforations, at least in one large randomized controlled trial of RA osteoarthritis patients. There have also been two randomized controlled trials looking at the use of COX-2 in IBD. So Bill Sanborn did a, um, a randomized controlled trial in ulcerative colitis patients in remission. And what he found was that two weeks of the COX-2 inhibitor celecoxib resulted in no uh, increase in relapse rates compared to the placebo arm. Now, you might say this is a short study, right, only two weeks, but there was a second study published in the Red Journal in 2006 in which they found that patients who were given NSAIDs daily for three months, and this was not just patients in remission, this was both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and some of these patients did have um, active disease based on um, lab markers, and they found still no differences in relapse rates in the IBD um, patients on COX-2 inhibitor versus non. So I will say in my practice, I am becoming more and more open to patients, especially who have uh, severe arthritis, to using COX-2 inhibitors. So if NSAIDs are ineffective or if other DMARDs um, are also not effective, then we're talking about anti-TNFs. And anti-TNFs have probably the most data for both peripheral and axial arthritis, and are also approved for nearly every uh, peripheral uh, spondyl arthropathy. Now, in the rheumatology data, uh, or the rheumatology guidelines, if the first anti-TNF is not effective, most guidelines actually um, recommend empirically trying a second anti-TNF without necessarily checking drug levels or antibodies. I think the rheumatologists tend to do this a little less often than us. Um, so that's just maybe one difference in practice uh, between um, our two uh, specialties. So what if patients are either refractory to anti-TNFs or are intolerant of this drug class? Well, sort of the new uh, two drugs that we have uh, that are FDA approved for IBD may be helpful. So ustekinumab, uh, we spent a lot of time talking today, IL-1223 blocker, approved obviously for Crohn's disease, but also has been, um, is FDA approved and is effective uh, in the peripheral arthritis related to psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. And psoriatic arthritis actually has a lot of overlap with IBD associated arthritis, so we can do, we can actually probably extrapolate a lot of the data and the um, FDA approval uh, for this purpose, but technically considered off label. In terms of axial arthritis, the data for the use of ustekinumab for at least ankylosing spondylitis has been mixed. So there was actually one positive open label study, but then the uh, subsequent phase three studies have been negative. So at this point, I think um, it's unclear if ustekinumab may be helpful for axial arthritis in our patients. Tofacitinib, we've heard a lot of, uh, uh, we heard a lot about today. Uh, obviously, a JAK kinase inhibitor approved for ulcerative colitis. It's also FDA approved for the peripheral arthritis associated with rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. In addition, um, uh, tofacitinib had. Um, two positive phase two studies for use in ankylosing spondylitis, and actually phase three trials are underway. So this actually may be an emerging uh, drug class that may be helpful in the, the very stubborn axial arthritis that we see in our IBD patients. So how about vetalizumab? Uh, we all know this is the gut-selective integrin inhibitor. And earlier cohort studies actually suggested that vetalizumab could sort of unmask or, un, or exacerbate arthritis in our IBD patients, even when the bowel symptoms were improved. However, reassuringly, there was recently a multi-center French study, which included close to 300 patients who were started on vetalizumab and then followed for a year. The patients who had inflammatory arthritis, you can see on the graph, uh, between 45% and 58% of those patients followed over the year. Their arthritis was actually in remission over that time period, and that's actually pretty decent um, numbers when you think about the other um, biologics used to treat peripheral arthritis. And so I don't think vetalizumab, vetalizumab is a contraindication, at least, to our patients with significant arthritis. So very quickly, I know I spent a little bit of extra time on arthritis. I'm just going to kind of give a more whirlwind, fast tour of the other um, extraintestinal manifestations. So starting with the dermatological manifestations, I'm just going to mention two. Um, erythema nodosum, we already mentioned, um, is an exquisite um, 
exquisitely sensitive marker of underlying bowel inflammation, so uh, certainly parallels disease activity. So if you treat the IBD, the enodosum sort of melts away without any other kind of adjunct uh, treatment. Pyoderma, on the other hand, um, can have a course that's independent of the underlying bowel inflammation, so often needs multimodal, multi multidisciplinary treatment. This is sort of a theme that I'll be going back to again and again in the rest of the talk. So thankfully, pyoderma is one of the least common manifestations, uh, affecting less than 1% of our IBD patients. Its incidence is equal in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It often begins as a tender nodule or, or plaque, as a, it's a, path, a pathergic phenomenon, and it rapidly evolves into a sharply demarcated ulcer with violaceous edges. It's most common on the lower extremities, but we know they can also occur around stomas, these Peristomal uh, pyoderma lesions we know are very painful, very morbid, and oftentimes very difficult to treat. So for pyoderma, the minority of very small early lesions can be treated with topical steroids or tacrolimus or intralesional steroids or cyclosporin. However, the majority of these patients, because, they're so, so pain, uh, because these lesions are so painful, will often need systemic therapy. And really, first-line therapy is sort of a one-two punch of oral glucocorticoids dosed at a, um, at a dose of 1.1 to 1.5 mg per kg, followed uh, quickly thereafter by probably infliximab is the most widely used for uh, pyoderma and has the best literature. There was one randomized controlled trial of infliximab uh, in which they looked at just one dose of infliximab at five mg per kg, and they found that 42% of these lesions improved with regard to pain and size. And in those patients who entered an open label extension study who received two more infusions at week two and six, 69% of the lesions improved, and actually 21% of these patients' uh, lesions healed totally by week six. Now, importantly, a predictor of response was whether or not the lesion was present for 12 weeks um, or more. And so it's really important that these patients really get started on effective treatment right away and not linger on steroids. Um, there have been multiple case reports showing that adalimumab is also effective in pyoderma. Uh, in patients who cannot receive anti-TNFs or are not or are refractory, oral cyclosporin is really preferred um, a preferred agent with our dermatologist, but of course, it's very difficult in our patients who are already on other immunosuppressants for their IBD. And so one potential promising agent is ustekinumab, and there have been many, uh, uh, several case reports showing that ustekinumab can be useful at healing pyoderma in t TNF refractory cases. Um, similarly, there have been uh, case reports of refractory lesions responding to thalidomide or IVIG, as well as hyperbaric oxygen. And I can't really emphasize the importance of an experienced wound nurse or wound team and really close multidisciplinary care uh, with uh, the dermatologist. So moving on to ocular manifestations. So scleritis or episcleritis, which is inflammation of the uh, outermost uh, layers of the so-called whites of the eye, um, parallels disease activity. So again, treat the underlying uh, bowel inflammation. These tend to get better. Uveitis um, is inflammation of the uvea, which comes from the Latin word grape. So it's inflammation of the entire globe of the eye with all of its vasculature and important structures. This often has a course independent of the underlying bowel inflammation. So again, requires multidisciplinary care. So as we know, uveitis presents as a red, painful eye. There's a whole host of complications that can, that can occur, including blindness if left untreated. Uh, First-line therapy is, is topical or intraocular uh, intra steroids. Um, and thankfully, the minority of these, um, of these patients will require systemic therapy. This can include antimetabolite or cytotoxic agents, but in truth, more and more ophthalmologists are really using anti-TNFs for these patients because there's a lot of data to support their use. There's two randomized controlled trials of uh, the use of adalimumab being effective in uveitis, and because these are obviously quicker drugs for a potentially uh, vision-threatening complication. So lastly, I'm just going to touch on hepatobiliary uh, complications, or PSC, because unfortunately there's nothing really um, that's effective in treating this uh, manifestation. 
We all know that it has a course independent of the underlying bowel inflammation. Um, and while there was early interest and promise of vetalizumab being effective in PSC, there have been at least two large cohort studies that show that vetalizumab is not effective in reversing the biochemical or radio, radiological um, abnormalities in PSC. So at this point, the only treatment really is liver transplant. So in summary, um, extraintestinal manifestations is one important factor to think about when you're trying to come, a, come upon a personalized approach to patients and treating the whole patient. And we should be mindful of those uh, extraintestinal manifestations that are severe, particularly the ones that are independent of underlying bowel inflammation, such as axioarthritis, pyoderma, or uveitis, because oftentimes these will require systemic therapy, and anti-TNS probably have the most data. However, in those patients who are refractory or intolerant of anti-TNFs, ustekinumab can be useful for at least the peripheral arth arthritis as well as pyoderma. Tovacitinib may be useful for both peripheral and axial arthritis. And then there are a whole host of other useful adjuncts, and particularly we should be think keeping a more open mind about NSAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors in patients. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.